And I think one of the most naive things that bodybuilders do, and if you blast at a level that's dangerous of a cocktail of whatever your bro at the gym told you to take, then you'll offset the damage that you did, which is just not how it works. And if we have a spectrum of, you know, hypogonadal to like, you know, steroid jacked out of the sky, the level that men should be at, they should be here and they're like here. So that makes a big difference for how much muscle mass you can accrue over 10 years of training. My question is, how many guys out there are like me that don't necessarily have any metabolic dysfunction, everything looks good, but they're just, they're heavy. And we know, at least historically, that heavy people don't live that long. Mm. Yeah, it, it's a it's an interesting question. And I think that the part that people always have to come back to is that we're all mortal. It's not like all of these th things are going to sacrifice our immortality. So- Unless we're talking about, you know, abusing massive amounts of steroids and dying young, which I think is a huge shame. And I think a lot of people are doing a lot more damage than they think that they are uh, because they're just not looking under the hood properly to realize what they're doing. And I think some of that's a coping mechanism. I think that some of that's a bit of denial. Um, I also think some of it's just painful ignorance too. But the the tricky thing with with testosterone that we have to look at is that testosterone is good for you up to the point that it's not. And I think that a lot of the research and a lot of the anecdotal outcomes as well really conflates bioidentical testosterone with anabolic steroids. Like, I don't know about you, but how many bodybuilders do you know who've only used bioidentical testosterone? Zero. Exactly. And I think that, you know, when we look at the, the research that was done on a lot of these, like if we talk about things like, uh, like you know, we're not talking about things like, like Tren or Superdrol and things like this. If we talk about what people would consider the, the safer anabolics, things like, you know, uh, primabolin, Masteron, um, Proviron, you know, things like that. A lot of that research was done in the 60s and 70s. Um, a lot of these medications are very old. I mean, primabolin, I believe, was introduced medicinally in the early 60s. Mm. Um, these are old medications. And there's not a lot of research on them. Um, and I think that people really, really are, uh, overestimate the benefits of these medications and underestimate the side effects of these medications. There's a reason why, there's multiple reasons why they were removed from medical use and performance enhancement is one of them. Also giving a woman 100 milligrams of mast prop three times a week for breast cancer probably isn't the right treatment <laughs> option. That's what they were doing. I know. Um, and they were like, it worked. And I was like, yeah, and what else happened? Um, and they were like, yeah, that's why we don't use it. In the studies, they, they go, yeah, it, it caused some side effects. It's like, no shit. Um, 100 milligrams of mass prop three times a week for a woman is just mind blowing. So the the tricky part with this is that, and, and this is something that, um, that, that Keith has spoken about a lot and I have a huge amount of uh, professional and personal respect for, for Keith and we used to butt heads a lot and then now we, we have a great professional relationship because we found a lot of common ground and mutual respect because we both really believe in this concept of evidence-based medicine. And I am not an advocate for guys pushing testosterone through the, it's, I'm not saying, okay, now you can go out and take grams of tests a week as long as it's bioidentical and you'll live to your 100. That's not at, at all what I'm saying. But I think that when it comes to bioidentical testosterone purely, we're looking at a compound that is beneficial up until the point that it's not. And then we have to ask and go, okay, well, what's that ceiling point? What's the point where it the, the sweet spot is overshot? And I like to talk about what we call in, in science the inverse U-shaped response, which is the fancy jargon for the sweet spot or like the Goldilocks zone. So they talk about the inverse U because it's this arc where it's basically like going too little is bad and too much is bad and the middle ground is good. And I like to use coffee as an example. If you stay up all night, no coffee is, you'll probably be tired. 20 coffees, you'll probably also feel bad, but it's a very different kind of bad. So there's a sweet spot. And, you know, depending on the guy, that might be one to three or four, depending on the tolerance. So I think that sometimes people think that that point that it tips over into being detrimental is uh, lower than it actually is. And I think that, and this is purely based on just now coaching and consulting thousands of guys on this. And that's not a, a bullshit flex number. It's a real legitimate number. I see a lot of guys who would benefit and do benefit both subjectively and in terms of blood work from taking an extra 20 to 30 milligrams of testosterone a week. 
And I think one of the most naive things that bodybuilders do, and you know, I'm not going to name any names because I actually wouldn't know anyone to name who's pushing this nonsense because I think it's just become this parroted, accepted norm, which is that if you blast at a level that's dangerous of a cocktail of whatever your bro at the gym told you to take, if you compensate for that by cruising at a level that's under what's optimal, then you'll offset the damage that you did, which is just not how it works. If you drink 20 beers on a Saturday and no beers for the rest of the week, you haven't offset that damage. It's just, it just doesn't make any sense. If you've just started TRT, it is completely normal to feel overwhelmed and confused. There's a lot of new territory to cover and there is a lot of conflicting information. I wrote TRT 101 so that you can have everything that you need to know in an instruction manual in one place that you can refer back to, that you can have all the questions answered before they even come up. TRT 101 is my best practice approach for, for TRT from start to finish and it contains everything that you need to avoid all the challenges and pitfalls that I've seen come up in my clients over the last five years. You can check it out via the link below. So I think one thing from the bodybuilding world and a lot of the stuff in the bodybuilding world which is a world that I've never been into um, obviously um, is one thing that's kind of seeped into the hormone optimization and hormone replacement space, depending on what people want to call it, is that you have to, for it to be testosterone replacement therapy, it has to be at this level that is on the conservative side. And when we're looking at correcting for hypogonadism, which is what I'm talking about and what a lot of my colleagues are talking about, we're wanting to optimize natural bioidentical testosterone levels. And I think for most people, and I've said this in my book, I've said it in my recent masterclass, I'll, I'll, I'll keep saying it, is that that tends to be above the reference range in lab work. And I think that there's multiple ways to find where that inflection point occurs, where it starts to exert toxicity. In research, bioidentical testosterone is very well tolerated by healthy men in high doses. And I'm not saying that people should go out and take 300 and 600 milligrams a week, but those doses in literature are pretty well tolerated in the parameters that they're looking in in the short term. So if something is doing harm to someone, we would typically expect that we would be able to observe some kind of symptomatic harm that would come from that. Now, the question is, you know, if you ran something that was harmful, but not acutely harmful, maybe in 10 or 20 or 30 years, and that would show up in your you know, your heart scans or whatever you're looking at, which I think is true. So it's it's a really tricky question. And I don't think that anyone is able to go, it's here. This is where the line is because the line differs. And, and the part that I think is really important is that that level of where testosterone can become harmful or where being too heavy can be harmful would differ based on how metabolically healthy you are. You know, if we take a guy who's you know, 40 years old and he's insulin resistant and he's drinking, you know, 20 standard drinks a week, which is, it's not uncommon that these guys are seeking testosterone optimization now that it's become mainstream. He probably wouldn't be able to tolerate a level above the reference range without receiving side effects because why on earth would someone in his physiological state make a testosterone level akin to what you would get from 200 or 250 milligrams a week? But if you take a guy who's fit, lean, healthy, has a healthy amount of muscle mass and eats well and looks after himself well, we do see both objective and subjective benefits to optimizing that testosterone level, which can sometimes be up to now, given how low the reference range is, even double the top of the reference range and sometimes even again, 50% higher than that. Wow. Wow. Okay. We'll, we'll stick to me as a case study. Do, do I look like I'm on more than a replacement dose? Looks like you've been more on, on more of a replacement dose in the past. Okay. That's the, from, but again, I mean, the level of physique that you have is absolutely attainable from optimal testosterone levels and training for a long period okay. of time. That's, that's really my, my only question because, you know, I, I don't know how many people have the time that I do to go to the gym. You yep. know what I mean? So I don't know how many people are actually doing what I'm doing to try and push my body mm -hmm. to that limit, you know, the volume, yep. the intensity, the calorie, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But um, I guess if this is attainable naturally, uh, what else are you looking at? Mm. If you're you know, trying to take a look under the hood to me, if I'm like, man, I'm concerned that I may be taking too much, but I actually have experimented with a little more. And mm. to be fair with you, even my partner noticed this, I had, I had there was better sex, better yep. erectile quality, more morning wood. 
Yeah. All everything was good. I think I was getting a little puffier though. Yeah. A little bit more water. But what are you looking at if you know if I'm like I'm good. There's not I got no symptoms, but I'm wondering if I could be better on a little more. Is there anything that you're looking at specifically with me? Yeah. And just to give a bit more context to like what is naturally attainable uh, versus what's not naturally attainable. The problem that we're looking at these days is that most men are subclinically hypogonadal. Mm -hmm. And so a physique like yours for the average guy coming up now who in his 20s has a testosterone level that the average 70 year old has, probably not naturally attainable. But were he to have the actual testosterone levels that a healthy young man should have, that's a very different story because we could be talking a two to three fold difference in androgen levels over the course of a lifetime. And I think that's the part that's really tricky is that what a lot of people don't understand is that a lot of men walking around these days, even if they're not clinically hypogonadal, they are pretty damn close to that. And if we have a spectrum of, you know, hypogonadal to like, you know, steroid jacked out of the sky, the level that men should be at, you know, at let, like let's say at 30, maybe 20, 30 years ago, plus with good diet, exercise, nutrition, just in terms of less exposure to xenoestrogens from the modern environment, they should be here and they're like here. So that makes a big difference for how much muscle mass you can accrue over 10 years of training. So that I think is a very important point that people don't look at. So in terms of the question that that you're asking is, I guess so just to just to rephrase the question is the question like how do we know when or if we should push it up and by how much? So that's a there's multiple ways I think to do that. And I always like to use the saying there's multiple ways to skin a cat because I think it sounds macabre and I think it's funny. But there's multiple different paths to the same destination. So one path, which I don't advocate people do because it's reckless, but it is effective is you push the dose up to that inflection point and then you back it off. It's not that reckless, but that's one way to do it. You, It's like a child. You find the line with nagging your parents when they snap. Like that's how a kid finds the line. So that is one way to find the line. The difficulty that we have is that we can't see someone's androgen receptor expression. And this is one of the challenges that we have when it comes to dialing men in on TRT is going, well, why is it that you take two guys who are the same age, they're both looking after themselves. Well, they're basically the same avatar of a human. And one guy, when he gets anything above the top of the reference range, he gets side effects. And then the other guy doesn't get any response to treatment until he gets to two times the top of the range. And we can't, in this day and age, they're talking about how certain new blood tests might be able to measure this. And I think that that's promising. We can't measure the expression of the receptors. So, the problem with or, or the limitation of measuring hormones in the serum is that hormones don't do anything in the serum. They only do something when they activate a receptor. So if you're playing pinball, which I don't know if they still have pinball machines, but growing up playing pinball at time zone, um, you get points when you hit the bumpers on the table. You don't get points if there's balls flying around. It doesn't do anything. Hormones are like that. So they don't do anything until they activate the receptor. So your receptor density and your receptor sensitivity is really important. And that's why when it comes to optimizing the outcomes of hormone replacement therapy, I'm very big on this idea of being like, how can we get you to live in a way, which you do, but a lot of guys don't, unfortunately, to optimize the expression of the receptors? And lo and behold, makes perfect sense given we're looking at a, a human organism, is that the things that optimize receptor sensitivity are the things that also optimize the production of testosterone levels, which is basically saying the body is primed to receive the androgens that it has. But there is still genetic individual variability, which we can't measure. So we have areas that we can control and areas that we can't control. So sometimes the issue is that guys don't need to take more. They need to make the dose that they're taking work better. And you can't just throw more testosterone at a metabolic dumpster fire and expect them to turn into Dwayne Johnson. It's not going to work. Some guys like to think it would work. It doesn't work. So when it comes to the blood markers that we would look at to go, someone has pushed the dose too high. And this is what we see a lot when guys come back and they go, hey, I know I was prescribed 125, 150 milligrams per week, but my personal trainer said I should take 500 milligrams a week and this is my blood work. And we can see and go, okay, liver enzymes jack. So ASC and ALT will spike even if they haven't trained for 72 hours prior. Okay. So that's why 
I really like guys to actually follow the recommendation to not train 72 hours or at least 48 hours prior to the blood test because that way we can go, okay, well, this now should be within range or close to. So ASD and ALT will spike um, in a unique variable way. So that's number one. Number two is that lipids will start to dysregulate. So if we have multiple blood tests of someone who's on TRT, assuming they're looking after themselves, you know, kind of ceteris paribus, which is this fancy Latin term for all things constant. So if they hold everything constant, lipids should tend to stay about the same. I mean, they'll go like this depending on the day, but they'll stay about the same. So if all of a sudden LDL spikes and HDL tanks, like acutely, then we can go, okay, this again in isolation doesn't necessarily mean anything, but in combination with other factors all at once, this can also represent that we now are moving into a problematic metabolic state. The other one is that blood viscosity will spike as well. So again, there's a lot of contention over what's called secondary erythrocytosis, which is blood thickening from antigens, which is not bad because it's part of the therapeutic mechanism of action. Red blood cells go up, blood gets thicker. That's not bad in the right context. But if you're constantly pulling a hematocrit of like, you know, 48, 49, 50, 48, 49, 58, then we're going, okay, this is now, this is a- and 58, you see yeah, that sometimes? Absolutely. Jesus. Absolutely. So if, and that's an extreme example, but if we're looking at, okay, let's say hematocrit spiked by, let's say something more conservative, it's gone from like 50 to 55 acutely, ASC and ALT have jumped up to 70 from, you know, 30s, low 40s maybe. And LDL has, you know, increased by 50%, HDL has gone down by 50%. That to me is combined with like symptoms. So like typically the symptoms, if someone overshoots testosterone by a little bit, so I'm not talking like if you start taking a gram because you're going to have much more acute symptoms, but if someone's overshot their TRT dose by like 25, 30 milligrams a week, the stuff that they'll typically report is increased postprandial sweating, especially after carbs. Um, the other one that they'll report is just inappropriate sweating in general. Now I run hot. You mentioned before you run hot as well. So again, that's a baseline thing. But if you're in a situation, you, you kind of know what clothes to wear and how you're going to respond mm -hmm. to the weather and environments. So if you start sweating inside, wearing what you would usually wear in that kind of climate, you can kind of self-assess that. So sweating, but particularly postprandial sweats going up as well. Um, and the, then the other one, and this is when it helps. I don't like people, well, if people want to track their sleep and track their biometrics, cool. I don't do it personally. I don't tell people to do it. But for the people who do do it, it is useful to get the data that they've already got. You'll just sleep, see that sleep just goes to shit. Deep sleep goes down. REM sleep goes down. Light sleep goes up. Time in bed without being asleep. But the architecture of the sleep cycles just goes out the window. Um, and that's because the central nervous system becomes overstimulated 24 seven. So you're not getting a proper circadian rhythm. Those are the main ones. And then if they're going to measure their blood pressure properly, and they often don't do that, or they're anxious about the increase in testosterone, jacking their blood pressure up. So blood pressure goes up. But if you can get an accurate measure of blood pressure, all of those things will coincide with increased blood pressure as well. So those symptoms tend to occur when the dose is too high. So the way that I recommend that practitioners do it is that you look at both of those factors. So we've got, you know, subjective symptoms and we've got objective measures in the blood. And the way that I like to do it is go titrate up. And again, I'm not telling people, I'm not a doctor, I'm not telling people what to do, but practitioners, you titrate the dose up by the least amount you can per injection. So typically if it's 250 milligram per mil, you're looking at a five milligram per injection increment on your insulin syringe. If it's 200 milligram, you're looking at four milligram per mil. That's like the, for those watching, that's like the little line on the insulin syringe that you can measure. And if you're doing two injections a week or three injections a week, which most people are doing, that will coincide to anywhere between like, what would that be? Eight and 15 milligrams per week of testosterone. And you titrate up by that increment every 16 weeks. Daily injections are ideal. If you can really frequently administer something with a very long half-life, you can keep your levels super, super stable. And I think that this is the most beneficial way to do TRT. However, how should TRT be administered? So TRT should be administered as frequently as possible.